Welcome, everyone. My name is Joellen Chatham, and I happen to be a member of the presidential program here at the Nixon Library, and I'm the director of the Center for Civics Education at Concordia University in Irvine. So welcome to this third panel, uh, to the audience here at the Nixon Library, as well as those watching live stream either at the National Archives and Records Administration or the Nixon Foundation, and of course this is being taped for C-SPAN, so if you really like it, you can watch it again. Um, on October 1st of 1969, President Nixon announced the Task Force on Women's Rights and Responsibilities. The purpose of the task force was to look at the status of women in the United States and recommend opportunities and programs that could improve that status. Six months later, the administration issued a report. The report was called A Matter of Simple Justice, which you can see online or through the Nixon Library. And it made a number of recommendations about women's role and prosperity, so to speak, in education, employment, housing, and other areas of life. And in fact, right here at the Nixon Library, there's a display on Title IX, which had to do with women's sports and which is under a lot of examination and controversy today, but it was a great step forward for women in sports. The fifth recommendation of the, of the task force said this, the country should appoint more women to positions of top responsibility in all branches of the federal government to achieve a more equitable ratio of men and women. Well, this panel will include four women that are going to discuss this movement toward more equity in the number of men and women at the top of the federal government, all branches. But these women have either studied or participated in that process. So I'm going to briefly introduce each one of the panelists, and then as we uh, go on, you'll learn much more about each one of them. To my immediate right is Dr. D. Borsma, he is the director of the Center for Ecosystem Sentinels and is a professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Washington. Then Linda Hobgood is to my far right, and she's the founding director of the Speech Center and an instructor in the Department of Rhetoric and Communication Studies at the University of Richmond. And on the screen, hopefully any moment, we will have Dr. Diana Carlin, who is Professor Emerita of Communication at St. Louis University and a political communication scholar. And finally, Anina McBride, who directs the Legacies of America's First Ladies Initiative at the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies at American University. So ladies, welcome and thank you for being here. I know there's a lot to learn with this panel. Do you want to come to you first, but before I ask my first question, I'd like the audience to know a little bit about you. Um, you as I said, you're the director of the Center for Ecosystem Sentinels, and you'll have to explain what that is. Um, you are a professor of the uh, Wadsworth Endowed Chair for Conservation Science at the University of Washington. You have five decades of professional field work, and I believe you started out studying the penguins in the Galapagos Island. You've worked for 40 years doing field work in Argentina, protecting penguins and their habitat. You've received numerous awards in conservation and species protection, but you're here today for a different reason. We've talked in several of these panels today, and I just mentioned it again, the Task Force on Women's Rights and Responsibilities. Well, Dee was a member of that task force. In fact, she's the only surviving member and I have to ask you a question. Uh, there were 13 people on that panel. Uh, two of them were university professors. One was a top aide to the New York governor. One was a judge, another attorney, a news correspondent, international representative for the United Auto Workers, vice president of AT&T. I mean, these are pretty heady people. And then there was a graduate student who was in student government at Ohio State University, that was you. <laughs> how did, of all the th hundreds of thousands of students, how were you picked for this important panel? All of these stories have certainly um, familial part.
parts that are really important. And for me, I was um, a student leader at Central Michigan University in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And I went there because my grandfather was president at Central Michigan University, and I wanted to go to Michigan State because everybody in my family went to the University of Michigan, including my dad to law school there. So I didn't want to really go to Central, um, and my parents were smarter than me, and my dad in particular, and my mother as well, said, look, if you go to Central for one year, you can go anywhere you want after that. Knowing full well if I went to Central for a year, I wouldn't want to probably go anyplace else, and in fact, I didn't. And so I, I was involved in student government, um, Amer at that point, uh, I was head and president of the uh, Association for Women Students because we had deans of women, deans of men. And I then became uh, president of the Student Senate. And one of the things that bothered me so much was in local parentis, which means the university is supposed to take care of you, as my grandfather explained to me. The thing is, if we want the women to be safe, we tell them that they have to go to their dorms or whatever at 11 o'clock at night, and then all the boys will go to their dorms. And I said, that's not fair. And in my family, it was supposed to be fair. And I complained to my grandfather about this all the time. He explained to me about in local parentis and how the university had to you know, be responsible. And so that, that's why you had to go at 11. I said, if you want everybody to go to their dorms at 11, then make that a rule. All men and women all have to do it. I really thought, and still do think, it's a matter of simple justice. And we still don't have the Equal Rights Amendment. And that is a really big problem. Anyway, I argued with my grandfather a lot about this, and we were going down to where my grandparents had their summer home, on a lake in, outside of Ann Arbor, and this came up. My grandfather said, I'm on the uh, board of trustees of Eastern Michigan University, where Virginia Allen, chairman of the Task Force on Women's Rights and Responsibility, was a trustee with him. And I said, look, you don't like us demonstrating in the streets about the war, you don't like all of these things that kids are, in your view, kids are doing, and we're not represented. So, unless we're gonna be represented, don't expect us to follow all these rules. And I'd worked for four years at Central to get rid of dorm hours, and we were successful. So, I said, if you wanna tell Virginia Allen, you're supposed to recommend presidents of universities for this task force, you tell her that what she really needs is student leaders. Students have to be represented. I said. I don't want to have to hold some guy's draft card to burn it to be illegal. I want my own draft card. <laughs> and I was 22 and draftable. <laughs> so I think it was that credibility. And my grandmother was in the car as we're going to the down. And my grandmother, one of the few times I've ever heard her speak up and raise her voice, said to my grandfather, Charles, you listen to your granddaughter. That's what I thought. I mean, and Virginia Allen called. My grandfather took the call. And my grandmother looked at him again and said, Charles, you listen to your granddaughter. And he passed the phone to me after he talked to Virginia Allen for a little bit. And Virginia Allen said, well, what do you think about this task force? I said, I think it's a good idea, but you need to have students that can represent our viewpoints, because nobody's representing our viewpoints about war. None of us want to go to war. I don't know any guy that has burned his draft card that was happy about being drafted. But you've got to have some input, and we don't have any input. And so that's what I told Virginia Allen, and then she said, would you be willing to consider being on this task force? And I said, I'm going off to graduate school at Ohio State University. I don't think that's a good idea. And I said, plus, I'm not sure you'd get me appointed, because I've been active in Students for a Democratic Society. That's a pretty radical group. At Central, it was really radical, but because that's in Michigan. <laughs> but um, I just wasn't so sure about all of this. 
And then I thought, this is such an incredible opportunity. So I didn't say no. And then I was called back by Virginia saying, okay, will you do it? And I said, you know, if you can get me the clearance, all right, I'll do it. And then I almost flunked out of graduate school because uh, they said it wouldn't, wouldn't take very much time. But I had to go to Washington, D.C. for like a three-day meeting once a month for like three months. And that was a really formative and meaningful experience for me. Number one, because of the people on that. There were judges on that, head of vice president of AT&T, president of Vassar. I'm the only one standing. And the most important thing that we advocated is still not done. We do not have the Equal Rights Amendment. We need the Equal Rights Amendment. We need it in the Constitution. Women should be equal regardless of their color, their race. Thank you. So Dee, in, in addition to your thoughts about the Equal Rights Amendment, what do you think the significance was of the task force? What, is, what did it achieve short term and long term? Well, we still don't have the Equal Rights Amendment. Right. So it's not done. And this is 54 years later. And I'm the only, I'm the last one standing. All the other task force members are gone. And yet we all felt really strongly about this. We need the ERA. And that should be one of the platforms of both parties, not just the Republicans, but both the Republicans and the Democrats have got to believe in the Equal Rights Amendment. So I think that's the stuff that's left undone, that it's up to the next generation. One of the things I think is wonderful about this is that some of the people on the panels have been young. I am not one of them. But I think it's important that young people be involved in all of our civic society. And if we leave them out, then I think we're doomed to failure. We have got to have all people represented. Well, thank you for serving on that task force. I think it was very important in those days to have a young voice, no matter what that voice was. And I think not only have women's rights advanced, but I think people are listening to young people. Uh, Linda, your, uh, your career took a very different path. Uh, you teach in the Department of Rhetoric and Communications, and you founded the Speech Center at the University of Richmond. Uh, I think one of the significant things in your career as a leader is that in 2001, you convened a meeting that ended up uh, leading to the National Association of Communication Di Centers Directors, which is still going today. But in your teaching career, you've also designed some very unique courses for your students. Um, I've got a couple of them here. One is the White House Said Today, Rhetoric of the Executive Branch. That's got to be exciting. Uh, and then rhetoric of first ladies. So these are fascinating courses that really dive in to political communication. You also initiated the Orator in Residence program, and you, uh, your program has featured many well-known, important speakers, such as the chairman of the NEA, uh, uh, former Ch uh, justice of the Supreme Court, Anston, Antonin Scalia, and others. Now, in addition to your academic work and teaching, you've also done political campaigns, you've been a speech writer and a campaign manager, and also you had a role in the Nixon White House for special programs, and you worked on the First Lady staff. Uh, you've also written articles and essays on some of these ladies. One of your articles was Wisdom to Know the Difference, the Rhetoric of Pat Nixon, and another one, a certain comfort, Betty Ford as First Lady. Now, when you were chosen for the White House position and then the First Lady staff, what qualified you for that? How did they choose you, and what was your role? That's probably the best question you could possibly ask. Uh, I came home from, from school, high school, my senior year, and my grandmother was recovering from surgery. I went to sit down with her just to spend a few moments. And she had on the television a talk show. I'm going to be aging myself. But it was something called The Mike Douglas Show. Mm -hmm. And his featured guest that early spring in 1971 was a woman by the name of Ann Armstrong. 
she came on the screen and the television wasn't big enough for that personality. She was full of vitality, energy, uh, just uh, uh, her substance, the substance of her remarks was fascinating. But again, it, it seemed as though the television just wasn't big enough to contain her. I actually wrote a letter that night and she had just been, she had been named co-chair of the Republican National Committee. Bob Dole was the chair, Ann Armstrong and Bill Evans of Delaware was, were the co-chairs. And I wrote her a letter, told her I had seen her that afternoon and if she could use any help, I was gonna be in Washington that summer. And she replied and said, let me know when you're here. It, it, she was the epitome of what the Nixon administration I think was trying to accomplish. And I worked in her office for two years, it was two summers, at the National Committee with uh, Lourdes Ulloa, Kitty Clyde, Eleanor Oberwetter, and a lady by the name of Kay Bailey, who became Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison of Texas. It was the most thrilling experience working with those women in, in a position like that because they were, they were, it was a heady experience. It was uh, early in the Nixon administration. They were determined to get much accomplished. The, the energy and the, the substance that these women brought to, the, to their various positions was thrilling to be a part of. Uh, I went to the National Convention with Mrs. Armstrong on her staff in 1972. And just to revert to an earlier panel this morning, I've been to five national conventions. There has never been applause for anyone such as that for, Pres for um, Pat Nixon. Mrs. Nixon approached the floor, and even if you go back and look at the video now, I have fairly recently, it doesn't begin to, it, it, to um, take into account the sustained nature of the applause, and the camera keeps going back to the same space in the, in the crowd, in the audience. If you could have scanned that crowd, she, Mrs. Nixon was just loved. And it dated far back. It, it, you know, it went back to 52 and 56, and all the years that she had herself been to national conventions. But she just, it, and she handled it so gracefully. And Jimmy Stewart and uh, Ronald Reagan were seated right on the dais, and they would not help her. She was trying to get them to help. And they even, she had a gavel, a gigantic gavel, where she tried to gavel the crowd into um, silence of some kind, and they wouldn't have anything to do with that. They were just cheering. There were tears. And as I say, I've been to, to conventions before and after, and it, there was nothing like that, that 72 convention with Mrs. Nixon. And maybe that had something to do with what happened next, but I applied for a White House internship. And so with a, a letter, uh, I had gotten the job at the National Committee, ended up at the White House in the Office of Proclamations with a genius, William Baruti, who later edited a journal uh, that many of us have, have um, had a hand in. And then I was, I, I worked for, it sounds like I was transferred, but a lot, but I worked for um, Bryce Harlow and Melvin Laird. And again, you can't learn from anybody like those two gentlemen. They, they taught so much. And I watched them deal with the press. They would meet with members of the press in their offices. And in watching the way they navigated with questions that were intended to be gotcha moments was, was again, inspiring. And from there, I went back to school. And the summer of 73 was tough. Um, the Irvin hearings were, had taken place. Uh, it, was, it was just a, a tough summer. And someone suggested I go see a government professor at the University of Virginia, where I was attending college. He listened to me for several minutes and did what I have since discovered as a member of the faculty is typical and probably not the worst idea. He said, this sounds like an independent study to me. And so he offered to supervise the independent study, which resulted in a paper. Uh, he was, his remarks at the end were very kind. I do not know how that paper got in others' hands. He did ask me if he could share it, and I said yes, but beyond that, I, um, I showed it to my mom and dad, mainly because of his comments. But I got a call from the White House in, I think it was January of 74, 
and Helen Smith asked me if I would like to come back and work on the East Wing side. And you know, to go from the policy to the, to the First Lady's office over in the East Wing, some people make the transition from East to West. I went from West to East and had a summer like no other, um, and, and uh, the memories linger still. I'm going to come back to you in a few minutes when we talk about the impact of your role and of Pat Nixon's role in actually for, uh, forging a public policy. But in the meantime, let's go to Anita. Anita, you also served in the White House spanning three decades. Uh, the Bush One administration, the Reagan administration, and then you were in the Bush Two administration, and then uh, Chief of Staff to First Lady Laura Bush. And all of your work led to your creating and directing the Legacies of America's First Ladies Initiative at American University. And you also serve as the executive in residence at the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies. Uh, you serve on many boards, and I think for this organization, it's important that one of those is the White House Historical Association. You've been the author of two books, and in fact, two of those books you have co-authored uh, with our final panelists, which we'll get to in just a minute. But one of those texts, which I just finished reading, is Remember the First Ladies, but you also wrote a pioneering textbook on the First Ladies, which is for college courses. Now, you were selected to work in the White House not once, but three times, and especially your responsibilities as the Chief of Staff for Laura Bush. Um, how did you acquire that position, and did you see changes in the First Lady's position over time during those three decades? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for the question, and I'm delighted to be joining all my co-panelists here and listening to Dee and to Linda. There's, there's a string of similarity on um, how I got started uh, to how they did. Um, you know, Dee talked about being involved in student government in college. I was involved in student government in high school. I was not you know, lobbying for things as important as she was. Um, I was lobbying for better furniture in the senior lounge, but nevertheless, it was a start for this interest and engagement of, of being uh, involved. Uh, but I never intended really to go into politics. I was a pre-med major in college. That didn't work out, but I ended up joining. I went over abroad in my junior year came back in 1980 in the middle of the campaign, the presidential campaign. Uh, the Reagan Bush um, uh, ticket is I volunteered. Uh, and that's how I got my start. And of course, uh, they won. It's always easier to be on a winning campaign than a losing one. I've been on both. Uh, but I wanted to move to Washington uh, after that. And, and I did and volunteered at the Republican National Committee worked, um, uh, finished college here at American University. Actually, I had was short a few credits and had to do that, but I stayed active and involved. And being in Washington was a great experience, how things are so much more open to you. Local news is national news. And that piqued my interest to stay engaged and involved. In 1984, I went back on uh, the campaign, uh, the Reagan-Bush campaign, um, also as a volunteer, but it was different. I was in the national headquarters and I met so many people, people that opened opportunities for me to join the White House. And like Linda, I was in correspondence. Um, I read I read mail. I read the mail that came in to President Reagan and helped to prepare uh, responses and samples of letters that went to him. I really understood the connection between the public being able to have access to their public officials. Uh, later went on to help write proclamations, um, something Linda just alluded to as well, and eventually went into the personnel office, uh, which I did for five and a half years through the end of the Reagan administration and through all of uh, the George H.W. Bush administration. That was an incredible opportunity to understand the operations of the White House, um, knowing what's happening from east to west and and each of every inch of the 18 acres there fast forward to 2000 um 
you know, I went back into the White House to help in the transition. All of us remember the 2000 election was one that, you know, we didn't know for five and a half weeks who the president was going to be. And the uh, team around Governor George W. Bush asked a few old hands who had worked in the White House to come back and, and to help. And I went in to help to set up a personnel operation and transition people in that were coming off the campaign. I never intended in staying um, in, the, in the White House. I had two young children at that point. I said I'd help you for four months to get them up and going. I ended up being there eight years, including a stint at the State Department, and then ultimately the job with Laura Bush. And I think, how did I get there? How did I get to Laura Bush? I think it was the background of having worked in the White House, familiarity with the White House, with the operations. I was her chief of staff in the second term. So in a second term, there's no time to waste. You realize how fast time goes. And I think she wanted someone who knew how to get their way around um, and to get things done. And also she was very interested in expanding her global platform. I had come from working for Secretary Powell uh, at the State Department for a couple of years, was involved in one of the initiatives of the Bush administration, was launching the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, which was something Mrs. Bush was very much involved in, is still involved in those issues. So I think all these things just came together over time. And I think also, to, uh, to be honest, you know, she was looking for someone who would understand the loyalty and discretion around a, a very you know personal job like that. Uh, and and uh, my my now husband, who had served as personal aide to George H. W. Bush as vice president and president, was someone that the family knew very well, and knew he did his job with loyalty. And I think she thought I would understand that and can do the same thing. So in all those administrations, of course, I watched transition and change. First Lady, every single one of them had an impact in their own way. Uh, Mrs. Reagan, very involved, of course, in the president's schedule, very much involved behind the scenes, and particularly the, the role in which this was alluded to earlier uh, in the first panel, um, her role behind the scenes and President uh, Reagan's uh, focus towards thawing relations with the Soviet Union. Barbara Bush had a different view. You know, she she felt she was there that what was happening in the West Wing was George's role and she had her role and she was very involved in the literacy uh, initiatives and uh, things that she cared about and established a, a foundation early on in her tenure to which she devoted considerable, considerable time. And, and Mrs. Bush, Laura Bush, you know, really had uh, came in with an interest in literacy as well. 9-11 changed a major focus um, for her and to pivot from domestic uh, issues of education reform to what was happening now on the globe stage, a global stage after the terror attack on the United States. And her her focus became more global. But each of them, you know, had an influence. Each of them had the support of their husband to do their job, which really makes a huge difference. And it really inspired me to do the work that I do now uh, at American University for the last 10 years, this initiative that really peels back the layers and examines the contributions of first ladies on our politics, policy, global diplomacy, and, um, and their legacies of things that continue well after they leave as first lady. Um, the first ladies know their husband's role as president, but they know their own role as first lady. And many of them have brought their own interests, their own projects that they want to advance, which uh, are not necessarily under the president's agenda, but complementary to it. Um, Diana Carlin, you've had a different career. You were professor emerita of communications at St. Louis University and a retired professor and administrator at the University of Kansas. And you have spent your career in teaching and research on a variety of related subjects, such as political communication, presidential debates, rhetoric, speech writing, women in politics, and first ladies studies. Now, as I mentioned, you and um, Anita have published several books together. One, Remember the First Ladies, 
but you have also spent 13 years on the advisory board on the Commission on Presidential Debates. Now, that's got to be a heady responsibility. And you created what was called Debate Watch for the Commission. You've worked with women politicians, not only in the United States, but in many countries. I would like you to tell us a little bit about your research and the work that you've done. And then I have a follow-up question about your other book, which I recently read, Gender and the American Presidency. So what motivated you to get into this whole area of political communications? Well, I came from a family that was very politically interested and involved. My father actually ran for office at one point. My grandparents lived between the aunt and uncle of my congressman, so I would see him all the time. And two doors, he was a Republican, two doors down was the head of the county Democratic Party, where politicians were showing up all the time, and I'd sort of sit in the backyard and watch that. I also was a debater, both in high school and college, and you know that certainly gets one's interest. I started watching uh, political uh, conventions when I was 10 uh, with my parents and other family members, so I, it was just kind of in my blood. Uh, and being an old debater and getting into communication, political communication was just sort of a natural place for my research to go. And you mentioned the, uh, the book, Gender and the American Presidency, which I co-authored with uh, Ted Sheckles at Randolph Mason and Nicola Gutgold at Penn State. And we, we looked at kind of the, the changes that have happened with women in higher offices. And um, I know you had said something, uh, Jolin, earlier about, you know, we had these nine uh, women we looked at who all were presidential quality. Their names had been mentioned as possible running mates in some cases. Others had been mentioned as women who potentially could run for president, and none of them ever got to that point. Some of them came close, like uh, Kathleen uh, Sebelius, my former governor. Um, she was one of the last three who was interviewed by Obama. And so we looked at these women's backgrounds and also looked at all the other research, some of which all of us had done, on the way the media treats women, and how these nine women were some of the time held back from either being on a, a ticket as a vice president or moving up into the presidency. And, and we found several things. There are actually 11 uh, what we called maxims that came out of those nine case studies. And it was a combination of Republican and Democrat women, uh, women who had been in the House, the Senate, uh, women who had been governors, women who'd been uh, like Elizabeth Doles to secretary to cabinet posts. And a couple of them really stand out when Abigail on the last uh, panel said that the women whose names were brought forward were extremely qualified, maybe even overqualified. One of those maxims that we found was if a woman is going to run for office, and this has been pretty much true and still is, she has not only to be qualified, she has to be probably better qualified than the men. And this has especially been true, and we talked about this in the book, uh, of women running for the presidency. I nearly wrecked my car in, uh, during the 2000 uh, primaries when Elizabeth Dole had done very well in a straw poll in Iowa, and the commentators were all talking about her great showing. And they first of all said, well, you know, she's been there a lot when her husband ran, so they know her. And then somebody said, but you know, this isn't good because she, she can't be commander in chief. She's never been in the military. I literally threw up my hands from my steering wheel and started screaming at the radio that our current president was not a veteran either. And that we'd had other presidents who hadn't been in wartime. So, you know, and then I realized I was about to go over a curve, but this, this has not been an issue now with Nikki Haley. She had foreign policy experience and no one started the commander in chief. So we've seen some changes. You know, another thing we found in that research was what I call the difference between style and substance. There's a real balance that women have to find between being feminine. Uh, if, you know, Hillary was criticized because she only wore pantsuits and that didn't look feminine enough, but they can't be too masculine or they, are then dubbed as being too aggressive as opposed to assertive. So we found that with a lot of these women we were looking at, many of them had achieved balance. And I think, you know, my good friend Nancy Kassebaum, former U.S. Senator from Kansas, is a really good example of somebody who had that balance and actually moved very far into the foreign policy and was considered as a vice presidential possibility for George H.W. Bush. 
So, so there's that balance that they have to have. Uh, the other thing in terms of the substance was something we called rhetorical finesse. Uh, once again, it's kind of choosing the language that doesn't make you look overly assertive or aggressive. Also, not playing too far into the gender card and that there's, and, and not being labeled as only concerned with women's issues. So have to be very careful about the kinds of issues they talk about. So this is some of, of what I've observed. And, and I'm really pleased about this day happening because I really think that the Nixon administration was a true turning point uh, for, for women and for making it possible for women to see the possibilities. One of the things Kathleen Sebelius said when I interviewed her for the is that you can't imagine something you've never seen. So if you've never seen a woman senator, if you've never seen a president, it's hard to imagine it. Diana, in uh, your list um, of commonalities for women in political leadership, you alluded to a couple of them, rhetorical finesse um, and not being overly aggressive or assertive, but you also suggested that women who are particularly in political leadership, especially those aspiring to be president or vice president, they must also have foreign policy experience, the ability to raise money, uh, they have to be charismatic and dynamic, they have to be attractive, which is kind of interesting, look the part, not have a spouse problem, and also must have the right politics. You didn't describe right politics, so I have two questions. How do you define, and by right, I'm, you don't mean political right or left, you mean something else, but I would like you to address that, and then with the other panelists, how do you feel about these qualities that uh, she and her colleagues have identified as being important for women in high political office. Diana, define right so, politics. Okay, what we meant by that was that it's hard to be a centrist woman and make it through a primary system if you're running for president. I don't think that applies as much on the governor level or even running for uh, Congress or you know for some other statewide offices or even local. But at the presidential level, that's what that book was talking about. The way the primary system works, it's usually one extreme or the other that's coming out of, of the primary system. And so a lot of the centrist women have sort of disappeared in those primaries. I did some additional research with one of my University of Kansas graduate students, Kelly Winfrey, who's now at Iowa State. We, we tracked from 2008 to, 2000, to 2020, the women who had run for president and you know looked at uh, a lot of those issues and, and some of it, you know, some of them fell out pretty quickly because they were a little too centrist and the extremes were beginning to be a little more of interest because that's who tends to vote. So there has to be a nice balance. I, you know, as I looked at these 11 again, I really think in some ways Nikki Haley ticked off the most boxes uh, of those 11. And, and her politics were, were not extreme. They, they were pretty much, you know, she was definitely to the right of anybody who's running on the Democratic side, but she wasn't as far right as some of the men, but yet she was able to find a balance that worked really well for her. And so I think if you wanna look at a good model, I think Nikki Haley was a good model. And talking about centrism, I don't think we see much of that among men today. There aren't too many people in politics that are not on one side or the other. Uh, Linda, your background um, is largely in communications as well. Have you noticed over the years the difference in political communications, not only between men and women, but have women adapted differently to political communications over the years? I don't tend to draw the lines quite that way, but... Uh, I, I remember a Senate race in New York between Elizabeth Holtzman and Geraldine Ferraro. And I remember that year when that campaign s started, they said this would be like no other because it was going to show that gentility and um, humaneness and, and uh, gentle, gen gentleness in, in your disposition they were going to be hallmarks of that campaign. If anybody remembers, they were throwing each other down the stairs of the subway. And it didn't exactly do much for women in public office. On the other hand, 
I think that um, it, whether you're, you're male or female, the need to be yourself is so terribly important. Um, politics and, and rhetoric come together in the message that you communicate and the self that comes across. And I, I know uh, Aristotle said all three artistic proofs, the logos, the ethos, the pathos, all should be like a balanced stool. It should be even. But in the end, the audience says, can I trust this person? And everything else hinges on that trustworthiness. Uh, my own daughter, when she finished law school and started at a, at a work at a law firm, she said, Mom, th these, so many of the young women who, can't, who have come um, on board with me are trying to be so forceful. They're really pushing it. And if they would just be themselves, they're so much more convincing. And you know, that said a lot. And it was really nice to hear it from my daughter because she had, she had seen something that we talk about in the classroom or in our research, but it was, it, she had seen it up close and personal and she, she saw all these women as their best selves until it became um, a legal argument or something like that. And then they felt they needed to draw on, on something else and it wasn't, it wasn't they themselves doing the talking. So that authenticity in communication is extremely important. Yes. And I think that also goes back to Diana's point about not being overly aggressive or assertive. In other words, don't try to be like a man, just be yourself exactly. and people yeah. will respect that. Dee, you did not have a political career, although you started out with a bang on that, on that task force. But not all, not all women that are in politics are working in political environments, such as the White House, or a top-level government agency, but many of them bring something else to the game, and that is expertise in a particular field. Uh, and in your case, it's conservation and biological preservation and so on. So how can women who are less interested in actually being a political person, but they're in a special field, how can you make a difference in public policy? Because you have. I think there's two things to keep in mind. One is, that one person can make a difference. And we've heard that on several, from several people on this, this panel and other panels that you've heard from today. So one person can make a difference. There's no doubt about that. Um, the second thing that I think it's important is obviously if you're gonna make a difference, you'd, you'd like to be on the side that whatever the policy is that you wanna change is gonna last for a while. I mean, I have to say that Nixon was incredible in that he got so much environmental policy through. I mean, if you read the Endangered Species Act and what he said about it, he sounds like he's from Greenpeace. It's amazing how much of an environmentalist in that speech he was. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that we do have different viewpoints and that those viewpoints need to be expressed. But you want to have them based on science. And let me tell you, in my view now, science is not counting for much. And we need to have it count for a lot because we're losing species really rapidly. There's two problems, and I tell my students this all, this, all the time, they don't like to hear it. There's too many people in the world, eight billion is way too much, and we're consuming way too much. What are you gonna do about it? I think that we can do something about it. I don't wanna do it the way the Ukrainians are doing it or how they're doing it in Gaza, Gaza, but we have to do something about the number of people and our consumption. And if you ignore those two problems, I don't care what policy you have, in the end, it will fail. I'm glad I'm as old as I am, <laughs> but I want young people that have an investment in living longer to make this a more humane and better world. And we have to allow differences in viewpoints but also more freedoms. I mean, I can't imagine what the Ukraines are going through, and the Republican Party in the past has been the one that has been defending America and what we're doing. Where are those people now? Where's the money gonna come from to be able to stop these wars? We've got to be better at that, and if we are better at it, then we'll have more species in the world, and I happen to care about penguins. <laughs> and I want 
penguins to exist long after I'm here. But we can't if we fish all the fish out of the ocean and depopulate um, all of our oceans, let alone our air. I mean, don't forget, the Air Quality Act, I mean, that's Nixon. I want to breathe clean air, drink clean water, and have lots of species. But both parties should have this. And we, as individuals, need to vote for those sorts of things. Otherwise, we'll never get them. Well, and if you saw her land yard up close, it has penguins on it. And I think, Dee, is, Dee you're a good example of what women who choose not to be engaged professionally on, in a political uh, forum, but to take the experts you bring in a particular field to the public policy making process. Now, I know you said your, um, at your age, your, won't mention your age again, but I will go back to I'm, 1789. I'm 77. So am I. 77. But what month? Well, 1946 was a good year. It was a, it was a very good year. Now, I know you were not around in uh, 1789 when the Constitution went into effect, although Ronald Reagan claims he might have been. Um, but during, during that time, um, there have been 71 secretaries of state. Three of them have been women. And obviously, since going back to 1933, when President Roosevelt appointed the first woman as a cabinet member, Frances Perkins, as Secretary of Labor, obviously more and more women have taken leadership roles. Um, but some of the, those of you who've worked in the White House, what have you seen about women leaders? Um, because more and more of them are taking these top professional positions in policy-making areas. Uh, Anita, what have you seen? You've been in the White House off and on for 30 years. What are your thoughts? Well, personally, uh, from when I stepped into the White House in 1984, I've always worked for a woman. Every office that I was in, there was a woman in leadership, from correspondence to management and administration to obviously the, the first lady's office. So I've had great examples. And again, listening through this conference through the day, I really do realize, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of so many others who really broke a lot of ground in White House leadership roles in the Reagan administration. Elizabeth Dole was head of the public liaison office before she went over to be, you know, a, a cabinet uh, officer. Um, a number of the uh, offices in the White House economic policy, domestic policy were run by, by women. You know, one of the last frontiers that really where we haven't broken the ceiling yet to have a secretary is a, the Department of, of Defense, of course. But we've been inching towards that as well. I mean, we've had uh, four of the service um, uh, secretaries over the last number of years have been women, Secretary of the Air Force, Secretary of the Army, Commandant of the Coast Guard, Chief of uh, Naval uh, Operations. Uh, so we're, you know, the, the Secretary of Defense role would be one that I think would, you know, be important uh, for women uh, in the future. Um, but I have always felt in my just personal uh, capacity and opportunities at the White House, I've always felt I had the mentorship and the support of women leaders that have allowed me uh, to thrive, actually. Diana, in your research, what criteria do you believe have been the most influential in helping both the public and political leaders uh, elevate women? What have been the greatest influences? Well, I think being successful. Uh, you know, there, there is a reason that the women who have risen to the levels they have in the cabinet or have made it into the Senate or have been Secretary of State, they have been very, they've done very well with their job. And, and it gets back to that point that Kathleen Sebelius made. Once you can see someone who has not been in a position like that, a woman, a minority, doing it well, it becomes much easier than for the women who follow. And I think we've had some incredible women leaders. They, they've really followed those kinds of principles. And uh, Linda, it was interesting when you mentioned authenticity because when uh, Kelly Winfrey and I looked at the, the 2020 race, one of the things we discovered was that the criticisms of the women were, were changing. 
and that the lack of authenticity was one of the things that was holding some of these women back, just as your daughter noted, uh, and likability. You know, people you know feel comfortable with someone, and we've we've had a lot of those women leaders. Um, you mentioned Anne Armstrong. She's another one who impressed me as a, a, a teenager. And uh, I would put her on the list of one of those role, role, incredible role models. Uh, the three women, uh, Madeleine Albright, Condoleezza Rice, Hillary Clinton as secretaries of state. And, you know, Madeleine Albright was one who balanced some of that. Her book about her pins, you know, that's a very feminine thing to be doing. Uh, but she was using a very feminine piece of jewelry to tell a story and to send messages. So I, I think it's a, a combination of having those excellent communication skills, balancing, uh, showing others and, and, and paving the way. And, and we've had so many of these women who've done that. Elizabeth Dole is another one. Uh, Nancy Kassebaum, as I said, I, I say, even if you start looking outside of elective politics, but Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, you know, the first woman on the Supreme Court and the way she performed over her period on the court was, you know, impeccable and, and, you know, kind of was oftentimes the deciding vote. So, and that made it possible for other women to be appointed. Uh, you mentioned Anita, the military, you know, another, I think, important Nixon appointee uh, was Jean Holm, who uh, was the first female uh, one-star Air Force uh, Brigadier General and the first female two-star uh, in any branch. And then she served in the Ford administration in that Office of Women's Programs. So, you know, there was another first that came from Nixon that we've now been able to have those other women. So success breeds success. And we've been very lucky to have incredible women who were selected uh, from Nixon on or who've run and won offices to really pave the way. I think uh, you used a word like ability. I think that's extremely important. Um, people tend to think being likable is being mushy or not having convictions, uh, when in fact, it's just the opposite. It's not only the right way to be as a human being, but strategically it works because if people like you, if you're approachable, they're more likely to listen to you than if you're not, and your whole point is try to communicate to someone. And the other point, and I think Dee brought this up, what President Nixon did in so many fields was intentional, uh, the, uh, looking for women leaders as well as issues on conservation and so on. These were intentional parts of his presidency and they made a difference. In our last few minutes, I'd like to ask all of you to answer briefly, uh, particularly for women who are in professional life looking to seek positions of appointment or elective office in politics, or young women who are still in school looking for their careers, what advice would you give them to get involved in the political realm with the goal of a higher level position? Um, Linda, let's start with you. I think that we, we come back to that authenticity piece. Uh, we have a dean of uh, the leadership school at the University of Richmond, and she is, I think, at least the fourth or fifth dean of the leadership school, but she's outlasted all the others. And they were all men, and she, in her own quiet, beautifully authentic way, has commandeered or steered that leadership school in, in a way that reflects so much her demeanor and personality, but also her philosophy of leadership. She's walked the talk, and, I think this is terribly important. We, we tend to not realize it. You know, one of, um, one of President Nixon's initiatives that wasn't mentioned in the previous panel that I happened to, I happened to be very interested in at, at the time and still am, was called revenue sharing. And I think the idea came in part from Daniel Patrick Moynihan. But the idea was based on the federal government being the best collector of revenue but then money that would go to the states or the communities would, would be um, subject to the local decision as to what it needed to be spent on. And if the federal government collected it and the, and the locality used it, let's just say they used it for a golf course as opposed to a hospital, the, at the local level, those leaders would have to bear the responsibility for what they did. And, the thing about that is it's hard. 
you, you would love to say, oh, we, we got that because the federal government insisted that we have it. That's so easy to do. It's much harder when you have the money and you have the responsibility for allocating it. But, but taking that responsibility, and I think this was really behind that program, was giving people at the local level a chance to show leadership. And women need that, men need it. it. It's really not a gender thing, it's a, are you going to, to take the responsibility for money that the federal government is, they've, they've collected it, but they are extending it to you, you will bear the responsibility, how it is spent, what it, it goes for. I, I just think that's a marvelous way of running a democracy <laughs> or a representative republic. So, so two great pieces of advice are be authentic, authentic and take responsibility. Dee, very quickly, your advice to other women? No, I don't have any more. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. <laughs> Anita? I'll take the perspective of students and young people since I work at a university and around students all the time and an advisor to several clubs, is get involved. Every experience, every opportunity is a building block for your future. And your network is a really important factor to your ultimate success. The more people that you meet, the more opportunities that you take advantage of, the more things that you learn. While you're in college, sometimes could be the easiest part of your life, take advantage of all of the opportunities in front of you. And not only the, uh, the, the clubs at the school, whether they are political or, or not, um, it's also civic engagement at any level. If you're interested, in, we're a school at American University really prides itself on putting it, many of its students into public service. They have to understand what the public needs. And that you know, is getting involved in civic organizations, volunteer work, all of those things just really build an empathy and an understanding for what's needed out there. And, and again, I'll underscore, build your network. It's really important. Diana, advice to other women? Well, I agree with everything everyone said up to this point. I, I think the other thing is, don't be afraid to push what you think are your limits. Uh, you know, some of the time I think women hold themselves back, especially thinking, well, I've never done this. You maybe haven't done that exact position, but you maybe have skills from something else you've done. And it's the advice I give my students who are graduating as bachelors with a bachelor's degree and say, well, you know, I don't have a job. Well, you've done X, Y, and Z. That's a skill that then fits this other position and use that as an example. And the other thing I think, especially women, there is sexism out there yet, uh, but don't let it get in the way, turn it around. And, and this is, I was on a panel several years ago about this topic and was on with a, a woman who was state legislator at the time. She eventually became secretary of revenue for the state. She was one of the first women ever put on the finance committee in the house and all men. And they said, oh, well, you can take the minutes. You can be the secretary. And instead of getting irritated, she goes, I would love to do that. That is an exalted position, Secretary of State, and she goes through all these different things. She then took those notes, she owned the notes, and she then created a piece of legislation as the freshman legislator, which got her notice and eventually moved her up to where she had a cabinet position uh, in, in one of uh, the Democrat governor's uh, offices. So, you know, don't, don't let something defeat you, figure out how you can turn it around, and I think that's really important is not only good advice, but we're out of time. And if it's 10, okay. I just want to say one thing. There's never enough money, but there's enough intuition and resourcefulness that you can solve things without money. And so don't let money. I mean, one of the things that bothers me the most is government that says, well, we don't have enough money to do that. Well, they'll never have enough, but there's other ways to do things. Well, these are four women who have lived what they've said. They've given us great advice, and we know it works because they've lived that advice. Um, please join me in thanking them for their experience and their participation. <laughs>